Hello adventurers and welcome back to my channel. Today I have something super special planned. Now I came up to Wyoming for the Wind River Rally and there were all of these different activities that you could do around the area. One of which was the National Museum of Military Vehicles. It looked really intriguing so of course made the short drive up here and here we are. Now we're going to be looking at a massive warehouse filled with so many cool things and I can't wait to take you guys along but first let's look around outside because this, this, this is super impressive. In fact, in this plaza, you can find a variety of different quotes from some of our former presidents. There are also some flags here representing all the military branches. And there are a few larger than life things that we're going to be diving into a little bit deeper. Uh, like this guy, this guy right here. Oh. It's so big. In fact, um, let me just kind of give you a size reference here. Let's do some walking. 5'7". Um, remember, remember, I am 5'7". Just to kind of give you an idea of the size of some of these. I, I don't even come up to the top of the tracks barely. In fact, inside this massive place, you're going to see over 100,000 square feet of military vehicles from different kinds of branches of the military. So it's going to be really interesting. So if you're one of my veterans out there, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you are not, you're going to learn a little bit with me today and we're going to get some brain wrinkles. I cannot wait. Let's go inside. Okay guys, we are inside. It was about $20 to come in and oh my gosh, as soon as we came in, there was a video that explained a little bit of what we would be seeing as we kind of walk through. Now they do free tours throughout the day also. So that's something to kind of look into, but oh my goodness. When I saw this online, I was looking forward to it, but I had no idea what we were in for. In fact, this is going to be an amazing military museum with so many details. And it's gonna walk us through each part of history and how each part of history impacted what kind of vehicles were being used. So that's kind of neat. But also look at this. There is a weapons vault. So we're going to go inside here to start off I think because it's just really intriguing. It's massive and there's some big big pieces in here. So let's go. in this one room alone. Oh my gosh, the history. Each one of these cases has a variety of different weapons that have been used and things that have gone along with them. And then at the bottom of each of these, you see a description of each individual item. So needless to say, this one room, you could be in for a considerable amount of time. Some of these things are super fascinating. I'm gonna show you a couple of the highlights, but this is one of them guys that there is no way I can cover everything in the museum because there's just so much cool stuff. In fact, if I were to go into this case area alone, we would be here for well over an hour just reading out loud. So what I'm gonna do, like I said, is talk about a few of the brief things that are the highlights of this portion, and then you have to come here to see more. I thought this was kinda neat. This is a group of women at a rifle practice in 1910, and it's showing here that they're using their rifles, but along with that, you can find out a little bit more about target shooting and sports rifles in this case right here. 
Every wall has some kind of interesting detail. Right here you can see muzzle loading versus breech loading. And then also it has some illustrations. So if you're not super familiar with guns, you can still kind of understand the process here. And then some of the different things that they have done. There's another one of these right over here also. And this is one of the more newly acquired pieces acquired in 2019. It was actually the real live musket that started the first shot at Bunker Hill. So this was Private John Simpson's. He actually kind of went before he was supposed to and got reprimanded for that, although he did sink the shot. But this was the very gun. The family had it up until 2019 when it became a part of the museum. Now this has to be one of the more interesting ones that I've seen. This is actually a briefcase that has a gun inside of it and then it shoots out the side over here. This is very interesting to say the least. And in this case, oh my goodness, look at these. These are rocket launchers, anti-tank missiles. You have some machine guns, some other launchers, just very interesting things. But in addition, I found out something super cool just now. Did you know that Walt Disney was affiliated with the military? This is where we found this. Let me show you. In fact, right here, we learned that Walt Disney himself was an ambulance driver in World War I. It was in the 1930s that his cartoons actually went along with the war effort, and he created a 22-minute training film for the Canadian Army called Stop That Tank. It actually taught Canadian soldiers how to use the British Mark I, and this ended up progressing the agenda a bit more for Walt Disney to continue to help during the war efforts, and they ended up going on to win an Academy Award for one of the productions that they created. Now Walt Disney wanted to do his part also, so he turned his animation studio into a place that could help with pushing out positivity within the United States and also support for the troops. So they did many of these different kinds of things, and it's fascinating to kind of go through history and see more of those, and I encourage you to do so. But with that said, I've shown you a few of the interesting things here, and I have one more thing to show you before we move into this room. Oh, this room looks cool, guys. Now, this section right here actually shows some of the more unique and distinct weapons. In this case also is the briefcase that had the submachine gun. But here you can see the more easily concealed ones. But there are a few very fascinating ones, like this one here at the bottom. Let's get a closer look. This is called the duck foot, and it's a 50 caliber pistol. And it's a specialty weapon because it's able to have four barrels with a single trigger. So it can cover a lot of ground in a tiny one squeeze. Also, we have these two. This is actually a Chicago Firearms Company Protector Palm Pistol, and it is a 32 caliber rimfire. It has a seven shot revolver on it, and it's T-tiny. It was actually developed for the Chicago World's Fair of 1893. Now, if you've watched my channel for very long, I'm not the biggest gun person, but at the same time, I do find it fascinating to see how history has changed and evolved, and I always say we need to learn from the past to make better tomorrow. So being able to see all of those, very interesting, and also to see how war has kind of progressed throughout the years and become something that is, even though it's not safe, a bit more safe. <laughs> now we're going to move into the main portion of the museum though. This looks expansive and each section is dedicated to a different portion of the military experience. So it takes us through a timeline. So each place that we see now, you're going to see some amazing really elaborate scenes, a lot of great information, and also we're going to learn a little bit more about how our military has kind of gone through conflicts and been able to come out on the other side, so to speak. So uh, I'm ready. Are you? Let's go. So this is kind of what it looks like and throughout. Again, great information, tons of photos, lots of pieces of information that you might not be as familiar with as we kind of go through. And this is going to paint the picture of why some of these vehicles were created and used. So I think that stopping and checking a few of these very timely pieces right here is very important. Like this starts talking about the German aggression and also Japanese imperialism. And in fact, it was 1941 when the American isolationism turned into being dragged into a war that they didn't necessarily want to be a part of. But when they were full force, they had to take a stand and they had to start making some moves. And that all began as a part of Germany 
invading Poland. Here you can find a photo of one of the destroyers. This was the USS Kesson and it was the USS Downs and they were at dry dock right here. Now you can follow the timeline and along each one of the galleries you're going to find a thing like this which is going to tell you a little bit more about what we're walking into but also it has a little bit of a map to kind of show you where we are in the overall experience. So here you can find the theaters, the galleries, and also the guest service information so that you can always find your way back to where you are to make sure you didn't miss anything. Now one of the things I really enjoy about military museums is I get to learn a little bit more about some of the people who have served in our service. I always appreciate them for their contributions contributions and being able to learn a little bit more about what exactly they did to impact different kinds of conflicts and also the troops that served under them. Fascinating. So this is General George C. Marshall. George C. Marshall was born in Pennsylvania in 1880. He actually led victories in two wars and he was considered to be the U.S. Army's Chief of Staff throughout World War II. He also served as the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense and received the coveted the absolutely amazing Nobel Peace Prize. So um, the gallery being named after him totally makes sense. And now we get to be amazed by what is this inside? As soon as we walk in, we are in the amphibious area and amphibious vehicles were extremely important, especially for the earlier conflicts because they had to find a way to get two things. So a lot of times they would do a landing in rivers, streams, or even the ocean and then bring people abroad and then offload them so that they could go and fight. So here we have some of the amphibious vehicles, but as we kind of get a little bit closer, we're gonna go and work our way around. As you can see, this place is really, really big and so well done. In fact, this is probably, I would say, comparable to the museum that I went to in Fredericksburg, Texas, that I thought was one of the best military museums I had ever seen. So go watch that video, see some comparisons, and we're gonna keep walking around and learn a little bit more about each of these. Now beside me you see some of the amphibious vehicles that we just talked about, but on this side we actually learn a little bit more about D-Day and how those amphibious vehicles really played a part in the bigger picture. It's kind of interesting because not only do you get to see the vehicles that people arrived in, but you get to hear some of the behind the scenes as to why they chose those areas and why they brought them onto land the way that they did. Now there are so many documents here and you can flip through some of those books that have been reproduced so we can see the plans. It's really interesting. One of the only places that I've seen that they've done that. Also, there's some really interesting facts here. Let's check them out. Now here you'll see that D-Day was considered to be the day of days and 3,400 Allied soldiers were killed or were missing. At the time, 73,000 Americans landed on Utah and Omaha beaches and there were a total of 11,590 Allied aircrafts altogether involved. So this was a massive undertaking. And in this case right here, you can actually find Patton's War Diary. So you come over and there is a little button right here and you can click it and whenever you do, the case lights up and you can see these volumes. There's two volumes. One is 700 pages. One of them is 1,000 pages. But you can also come to the end over here, just past this, and actually flip through some of the pages that would have been in this. And this is like his diary, and it has some different pieces that tell you a little bit more about what the overall secrets and plans were. Very fascinating documentation, and it just keeps going on and on and on. So this is one of those moments that if you have some time, your pass gets you two days of access. Take the time, read the book, 
really great information. So once people managed to make it onto the shores, what happened next? Well, they had to create areas that were like a headquarters. So they needed other vehicles to be able to navigate around. So this next section actually tells us about that process and what kind of headquarters would have looked like and the people who might have been stationed there and what would have happened there. This is considered to be the beachhead operations. And it says here that beachheads enabled further advances and also were able to be a logistic standpoint for them to evaluate things. So right here we have one of the M14 trucks and this was used by the Marines. It was used as a two driver and passenger or assisted driver vehicle and it measured about 15 feet in length. The Indian bikes now popular amongst recreational bikers was actually used in wartime also and this is the Indian 841. It says here that the engine was 45 cubic inches and it weighed about 550 pounds but had about 25 horsepowers and could hold five gallons of fuel. This much larger unit was called a VC-1 command car and it could actually hold five passengers and a driver. It was about 15 feet and eight inches and it had a 16 gallon tank on it and this was created by Dodge Division of Chrysler Corp, believe it or not. They actually manufactured about 400,000 of these for the armed forces during World War II. Alongside command, they also needed a way to be able to take care of soldiers that were injured. So they have this, the WC-54 ambulance. This was actually a signature U.S. ambulance during World War II. It was one of the first ambulances that was designated to evacuate casualties. Now, this had the ability to have a driver and an orderly and up to four to seven passengers which would have included patients and it was approximately a 30 gallon tank so it could go a pretty decent distance in order to evacuate people now picture this we're standing here this would be like the beach we would load up on one of these things through this massive ramp right here and then you would have all of the other troops in there with you and what they would do is they would take everybody to a part they would drop this gate and everybody would just storm off onto the beach to do what they were supposed to do and a lot of times that meant taking cover a lot of times that meant immediately entering into fire but this could hold a lot of people and as you can see it's actually a sea vessel so this would float through the ocean find a beach drop down and war would begin similarly this one actually could fit one of these smaller jeeps on there so they could just drive right off onto the beach and start up their command post or start doing what they needed to do but not only was it smaller this was actually one that would travel across the land so you can see the difference between the various kinds of vehicles that were part of this conflict. Again, perhaps one of the most impressive parts of this museum is not only does it show the vehicle, but it also shows it in use. And through the murals and then the photos, you can really get a sense of the feel of what it was at that time. So something like this would have been packed full of people and they would have been having a focus that they would have as soon as they hit the land to go and do. And you can see that reflected right here. You can see in their eyes the intensity, sometimes the fear and uh, the purpose is definitely there. So it really does make it more than just a vehicle in a room. It makes it about the people also. And I think that that's important. We next move into the airborne operations, which was a pretty new concept during World War II. It was actually something that really made a huge difference whenever paratroopers were introduced into the war effort. Inside this area, you find a bunch of different things, including some weapons, some scooters, and of course, again, one of these wonderful murals, which kind of puts things into context. We also learn here that Geronimo, or the U.S. Airborne Operations, was actually formed July 1940, and their main jump was in 1942. As we move into our next gallery, we learn a little bit more about two separate conflicts. Here we have the Battle of Bataan, and we also have the North North African campaign. Now these all took place between 1941 and 1942 and you can see here the reflection of how the paint has changed on different things to reflect the location. Our military does that pretty frequently but it's interesting to see the colors. It's also interesting to see how things kind of evolved as they moved forth with the technology.
Now this was considered to be the disaster in the Philippine Islands, and it was crucial to Japan's war plans initially. The islands were defeated by Filipino soldiers and the U.S. Army garrison. Now following these devastating attacks, in 1941 the Japanese landed and allies withdrew, and that is where this conflict began. This right here is considered to be an M3 light tank Stuart, or a Stuart tank, and these were affiliated with the first tank battle in the Philippine Islands. It was actually dispatched in 1941, on December 22nd, a platoon of five M3s from Company B ended up having a conflict, and this was considered to be the first tank battle using a tank of about this size right here. Now, just for reference on size, this could fit four people, including a commander, a driver, a gunner, and a loader. So four people could fit in here, and this is about 28,000 pounds, but it is also much smaller than the one outside. In fact, the tread pattern on this one only comes up to about my waist, so much, much smaller unit. The flip side of this diorama, we have the most widely used Japanese tank that was also involved in this particular conflict. This is the Type 95 Hako tank that is also a lightweight. It only is allowed three people inside though for space, a commander, a gunner, and a driver. Now this one is about 16,000 pounds and as you can see here you can kind of follow the diorama and again signs below and you learn a little bit more about the scene that we're looking at. This would be considered to be a Japanese soldier and he's wearing his traditional Japanese army khaki service uniform but it also is being adapted for tropical conditions so it's not quite as hot and also has some precautions for the different things that you might encounter in those particular areas. Now following this conflict came the African conflict and allied forces mostly of from the United States landed on Northwest Africa. During this time in 1942, early victories were thought to have happened as a result of several different engagements here. And this is correlated through the vehicles on this side. Jeeps like this British SAS Jeep or SAS Jeep were considered to be hit and run attack supply line Jeeps. They would go in, go quickly, and they would use special forces to disable their opponents through these hit and run raids. This particular Jeep was a three passenger Jeep and also could accommodate one driver. You can see here that they have gunner's nest right here in the front and also you can see where you can actually aim through this tiny little piece of protection which actually looks like it magnifies just a bit. This mammoth right here is actually the M7B1 HMC Priest. It's a self-propelled gun called the Priest. It is a larger piece to say the least. It actually could hold seven including a commander, gunner, driver, and four cannoneers and it weighs about 50,000 pounds. Now this max speed is about 24 miles per hour but it can only go about 85 miles. So you see here again the tread pattern on this is a bit taller than the last. This comes up to about chest high and then behind you have a bit of a shield right here but there are seats kind of right behind this and then this large gun that could definitely make a difference. Now this particular conflict, it was said that the howitzer reigned supreme and it became one of the most widely used guns at this time. It also had one of the largest impacts on the overall war presence as it was extremely deadly. Now I think it's really interesting that they cover each one of these in such detail because it tells you the specs but it also tells you some of the other pieces of the puzzle as to how it's been implemented, used, and then when it was retired from service. So at each one of these stops you can see details about all of them. This one is actually a half track which I think is one of the more interesting vehicles that I've seen because it has regular wheels in the front and then a track system in the back. It is a one driver 12 passenger unit and it it is about 20,000 pounds. Now in the background of these right here, you can kind of read along the wall and it shows you the different placements of different things that they were working towards. So each one of these shows you the task force positioning and what cities that they would move into or what cities that they would call their base. And then additionally, you also have some of the non-American kinds of vehicles here too. For example, they have an Italian Model 35 gun and an Italian TM40 heavy tractor here also in this area. So like I said, guys, there's no way we can go into each and every detail. There's just so many. We're only in the second room of vehicles and oh my goodness, best collection ever. <laughs>
<laughs> like as we move on to this wall, we see that powerful enemies must be outfought and outproduced. We must outproduce them overwhelmingly so that there can be no question of our ability to provide a crushing superiority of equipment in any theater of the World War. And that was said by President FDR himself, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Just past this, we're going to move into the rotunda of American combat vehicles. And this rotunda will present six predominant categories of World War II American combat vehicles from medium tanks, light tanks, armored cars, reconnaissance vehicles, and half tracks, in addition to artillery and tank recovery vehicles and tank destroyers. In other words, if it was used between 1940 and 1945, it is probably here in this room in some capacity. So I'm going to just let you guys kind of take in some of these and then we'll chat after. Now seeing some of these larger tanks and then talking about how many people could fit in them, you might be curious, how do they fit them in? It's like a little puzzle. Well, there's actually an illustration of what that would have looked like. And also a bit of a description about what life would have been like in a tank. It's not the most glamorous thing. It's definitely not one of those things that you want to do if you're claustrophobic, but it kind of looks like this. This illustration here gives a really great representation to us who might not have military service in our background to kind of let us know where everyone would have sat, how they would have fit, and how it would work. Now this looks like a larger style tank because they do have four different people and then one up top here, but they have a little bit more room. Some of the others were a bit more compact and more sardine can like but you can see what each person's function would have been with sitting in their particular seat also here we have a great idea of what you would actually see from a tank above you have what it would look like with normal full range vision if you were just looking on below you have what you would actually see from a tank and it is a much more limited scene as you can see now looking on at this you might think oh that's something that someone who is in the air might wear but nope this is actually tank headgear this is something that would be worn while inside it has a set of goggles and then also something for communicating and breathing and it would have been something that would have had to have been worn for a lot of different reasons you can see here also that there is a chest headset and then also they have more information about the goggles and then what this helmet would have been made of also now in this room, as you can see, there are a variety of different styles of vehicles and then also equipment that was used. And it's fascinating to see the difference from piece to piece, but also to read the history. So this is a room filled with information. And I was kind of surprised by a few of them. They don't just have the American vehicles here. They actually have some German tanks as well. So you can kind of get a size comparison and then also read the specs to learn a little bit more about what set each of the military service units apart from the next. Here we enter into the Red Ball Highway or the Red Ball Express. This was actually something that occurred after the Allies broke away from Normandy and began their advance. In fact, they outpaced the logistical plans by so much that shortages became a problem. Now, during this time of 1944, 133 companies moved nonstop trying to navigate over 600 miles. And it was an effort that they did at such a break pace that this became the occurring problem but ultimately this ended up being a huge point of impact overall it says here there were actually two phases to the Red Ball Express and during this time you could see two routes going to resupply Patton's army. Now after coming ashore during D-Day, this is kind of where we progressed after that. And you can kind of follow the map and see where different points of impact and different conflicts might have arisen along the way in the restocking process. So now let's go check out some of the vehicles used for this massive line of transportation. We start out with the WC-40. This was actually something that was used a lot by the U.S. Armed Forces. 400,000 of these trucks were built. 
for this and they were built by Dodge and uh, they could have two passengers. One was a driver and one was going to be a co-driver. They measured about 15 feet 11 inches and they would hold 30 gallons of gas. Something you might not think about in wartime is actually a wrecker but this was the Diamond T wrecker. It was from Howitzer prime mover and it was considered to be a standard wrecker. And using its rear wrench it could pull about 25,000 pounds and during its front winch you could pull about 15,000 pounds. So this was a super sturdy unit that could be used for a variety of different things. So it was a necessity to have this while moving goods and services and also people. Unlike the smaller Jeep that we just looked at, this is the WC52 cargo truck. This had one driver and nine passengers. And as you can see, it is actually kitted out with a gun. So it could have some defenses also. This was used for its mobility during World War II. And it was also a Dodge product. Now something pretty fascinating about the Jeeps, at least to me, is the fact that they could run with or without cover, meaning that they could put a cargo tarp over the top to safety people kind of conceal them, or they could also cover up items that they were transporting so no one would know what exactly was in the back. And also they could pull it down like this and have a more open air so that whenever they're going through, they could have everybody pointing their guns and using them accordingly also. So After coming ashore and setting up their beach headquarters, then they moved forward to an actual physical command post. The command post would be more centrally located to the conflict, but also be strategic so that they could protect the people who were making the plans and executing them. They were also a place where they could bring supplies and be able to send them out to other places that they were needed. And here we enter into the command post area and see a bit more of what that might have looked like, what kind of vehicles would have been used on the post, and also some of the interesting things that you might have found. For example, here in the back is a half track, and the half track started out as a transportation vehicle, but it could easily be converted into a variety of different roles, including a radio car, and that's what this one right here is. It was actually used to be able to convey messages and also to have less static and more audible sound. And that was very important for being able to communicate with people who were further into the field. Here you see the Willie MB Jeep. This was one of the most versatile military vehicles and one of the most important ones. It was made to be suitable for many roles, including using it as a mobile command post, a utility vehicle, or even a mobile ambulance. Now inside the command post itself, you can see a variety of different things going on. You have some Someone sleeping on a bunk inside this tent. You have someone who is working the radio to communicate messages. There is someone who is physically on a phone contacting and speaking to people. There is a map over here where they're looking at the cartography of the area so they can figure out the best pursuit method. And then also you'll see a few other things kind of scattered about the camp here that would have been very important. December 16th, 1944, the Battle of the Bulge took place. This was a major attack and it was the last major offensive of Germany. It's kind of interesting when you're coming through and you see each one of these units and some of these were physically in battle at that time. Each of these has a story of its own and long past the story we see below, each of these tanks has a history. So if you're looking at these and you're seeing them as just a vehicle, think beyond that. Envision the people that you're seeing right here. Think of those as real people and the stories that they had from that day. Some of those people did not make it home. Some of them did, 
but telling their stories through the vehicle is very important because you see how they spent their time while trying to defend the country that they were defending. Also, how they tried to protect others through these particular units. It's quite fascinating as you look and again get the perspective of each one of these. But also you can get the size reference and comparison of what it would have been like. This guy having to work on something in the frigid cold snow with the snow capped hillside in the background and probably only the sound of loud exploding bombs behind. For example, this in M18 tank destroyer right here is actually a Battle of the Bulge veteran. It was called the Hellcat tank and it served with the 603rd tank destroyer battalion. Again, remembering the human impact on this, you can actually come here and learn about the commander of this particular unit. He was from Utah. And so I think that piecing together these pieces really does put war into perspective for us but also again the people and that potentially is the impact of this museum more than anything now this museum was opened originally in 2020 so it's a pretty new museum the displays here as you can see are very elaborate and i just learned that this is actually a private collection owned by one man one man who wanted to give a gift to the world and to the veterans and i think that that is fabulous after six years of war, Adolf Hitler committed suicide in Berlin, April 30th, 1945, and a week later, Germany unconditionally surrendered. It was a challenging period that followed. Germany was completely divided, and it was broken. In fact, military prisoners were returned to their homes, but millions of Europeans were still left homeless. This is the result of surrender. I can't even imagine what it would have been like to be in those days. The images of the total destruction, the homes lost, everything people knew had been flipped upside down. Everything that they had grown accustomed to also started to change because the shift back to a normal version of reality was impending. But the military presence was still very much so active and pieces of German equipment littered their streets, their broken, broken streets. It's here that we get a good idea of what it might have been like on a very small scale. Broken bricks lying about everywhere, abandoned guns and associated equipment, sadness as people returned to find things were not as they had left them. More sadness as people lined up and searched for bodies. War is an ugly, ugly thing. And it impacts not only those serving in it, but those who call the areas home also. During World War II, motorcycles were heavily used. And here you can find an amazing display of German BMW R12s and other various motorcycle units. This is a unique thing that I've never seen. This is actually a motorcycle base that has a tank exterior and it's called a Kittenrad. We now are going to enter the Cook Third Class Doris Miller Annex and again get a little bit of perspective as to who this person was. He was a Navy cook and he was a hero of Pearl Harbor. Now Doris was a native of Texas. In fact, he hailed from Waco, Texas, and he was one of the first African Americans that was ever acknowledged for their service in such a way in his efforts for Pearl Harbor. And his efforts say a lot about his character, let me tell you. This sign right here tells a little bit more about him, and uh, we're gonna celebrate him, and then we're gonna go inside and find out more. This is Doris Miller. In 1940, he was assigned to the USS West Virginia. Throughout July and also August of 1941, he went to the second gunnery school also. It was December 7th, 1941. He was a mess attendant at the time and he was just finished serving breakfast and was cleaning up. 
When general quarters sounded, Pearl Harbor was under attack and Miller rushed to his battle station. The anti-aircraft guns amidship found them damaged, they were inoperable, and Miller was then ordered to help rescue sailors. He ended up doing so with Captain Mervyn Binion. And for his efforts on that day, he was given the Navy Cross, which is a huge honor and uh, a reason why he was celebrated. So now we're gonna go into the gallery bearing his name and find out a little bit more about the things that go above and beyond when you're called to duty. Inside this gallery, we learn about the 761st Tank Battalion. It was considered to be the first black armored unit, and it actually later was nicknamed the Black Panthers. You also can find out a little bit more about the Tuskegee Airmen, which is a fascinating story. I definitely implore you to look into this a bit deeper and then also come and see this display. But in addition, the 442nd Regimental Combat Team was a Japanese American response. And I think that this one is one that I have not yet read too much about. So we're gonna have to lean into this one a little bit more at a later time, but in addition, this also mentions the internment camps. Now this is something I've touched on a little bit more at some of the other places that I have been. It's a very sad moment in American history, but I think it's very important that we educate ourselves about these a little bit more. 120 Americans that had Japanese ancestry were asked to leave their homes forcefully. They were put into private sections and they were secluded there because they thought to be a threat. Although, come to find out, none of that was actually true. And so they helped these people pretty much against their will for a continued amount of time, which is an absolutely tragic piece of American history. Now, for those of you who are at home thinking, oh, that was a long time ago, there are actually people living and breathing today who still were in those internment camps. So before you think this is all in the past, no one's impacted by it, we have a lot of people still to this day who are impacted by that sad history. So I encourage you to look a little bit deeper into those things also. But now we're gonna move into the next section of this room right over here. As we move into the next section, I will say this, some of the images here are a bit more graphic because they are real photos, again, from things that have very much so happened. And history is not always a pretty thing. So we want to be respectful, but also learn about this history. So I'm gonna walk you through a series of events. And if you are a bit, more squeamish, you might want to fast forward through this part. It is here that we learn about the Nuremberg trials. These were the first international war crimes trials that actually happened. And they happened as a result of what the Nazis had done to the people that they had held in camps. This was a really tragic moment in history that affected so many. So many did not make it out of this time. But this particular area talks about not only that, but the Holocaust itself right over here. And again, a lot of graphic images that are a little bit harder to process. But I think it's very important that we do touch on this. Six million Jews that lived in Europe in addition to North Africa between 1933 and 1945 were massacred. And it was based on just race, biology, and behavior. And so because of that, that is why the trials took place that you can read a bit more about here. But something that isn't covered quite as much and as frequently is actually the Asian Holocaust and the Japanese abuse of the POWs. I think that this is also a very important thing that we take a little moment to learn a bit more about. In fact, in the Japanese military culture, they believed that a soldier would surrender rather than die. And if he did, he was an alien, he was bad, he was terrible. So they believed that it was okay for the abuse to be perpetuated. In fact, during this time also, the Asian Holocaust was taking place. It just so often is masked over by the Holocaust within Germany. But I think it's important that we realize that both of these were very, very impactful to not only the people who were fighting in the wars, but definitely those who were lost. Now, while in this section, we're finding out a little bit more about the Japanese artillery, the Nazi artillery, and then also some of the anti-tank military actions that were taken. And some of the things around the room 
are looking very similar to the first room that we went in that was massive, but you might see different sizes of them. Now, each one of these had a purpose and also a function, and some of them do look a little bit more antiquated. And it's fascinating to see how the different countries would use different things, and their technology might not have been at the same place. And so they would improvise, in which case they have some very fascinating variations here. Now, I'm gonna just show you this room kind of in passing so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. But again, each section, very impactful because it allows you to see what people were physically fighting against and with. Believe it or not, this is a true scale model of a very interesting shell encasing. This stands 13 feet, nine inches tall, and it had a range of about 29 miles. So imagine this spiraling through the air for 29 miles. What could have fired this though? Believe it or not, this guy. This is a railroad gun, and it would have been able to be wheeled into wherever you're wanting via the railroad, and then it could just offload these massive 13 foot long bombs through the sky using this massive gun to shoot them at their targets. Now, this is something I have never seen at another museum, and just seeing the model, there's so many little details within this that make you realize how many people could fit on one of these. I mean, these are some of the vehicles we've been seeing the true scale model of, and see how much larger it is. This is a 172nd model. That means this thing was huge. And behind this, again, the murals say a lot, but there is actually a photo here that shows you what it would have looked like when it was in commission. Now, this was something that was absolutely terrifying because this was not something that was normal. And so it had to be something that whenever they saw it, were like, oh no, how are we going to do this? But um, look at this. This is actually Hitler himself and some of the German officers looking on at their new railroad gun and as you can see it is even bigger in appearance than you could probably imagine this thing is huge they ended up building two of these and both of them were destroyed at world war ii and captured um, so they didn't want this to go very far and they needed it to be gone and eliminated so it became a big strategic point to eliminate this because of its power and impact now you're able to get some reference on size when it comes to what people in the military are experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis through this display not only here but also here these are average size items that as a regular person, we don't have a real concept as to how large they are and how far that they can go. But again, because of how they have the museum set up, you can see a visual and also learn a bit more about what it would have done, how it would have been used, and also see photos of them physically using them. So it gives you an idea as to what it would have been like to be in those moments and also how the firepower would have worked itself. So I think that's super important, but <laughs> something that that is fascinating is this right here. This is actually the back part of a gun turret, which means that this is where they would have often unloaded things. This thing is huge. It's larger than the car that is right here. Massive. This would have been on a battleship. So we're getting to see a little bit of every branch of military service here playing out. But also, again, size comparison is one of the biggest things when you come to a place like this because it puts things into perspective.
Now as we move past this and just before we go into our next display room, here are a few cold hard facts that aren't easy to process. These are the World War II casualties by nation. And you can find here that the United States actually lost 419,400 people. That was 0.32% of our total population as a whole. We were not the country to lose the most people despite losing that many, however. Overall, Overall, total deaths occurred around the world were 76,500. That included 53,250,000 civilian deaths. Poland alone lost 17% of their entire country in that war. 17%. And they weren't alone. There were many other countries that lost large populations of their countries. Lithuania, Latvia, and the island of Timor, they all lost over 10% of their overall people. And many of those were civilians. So when we look at the World War II situation, we're not just looking at an American war or a German war. We're looking at all of the different nations that were a part of this and all of the different people. And when you start really looking at these figures, it's the sombering truth that the world lost a lot of possibility in this war. There were a lot of people who had hope. They would wake up one day and they wanted to be something. And they didn't have the opportunity to do that after this. They didn't have their family members that they had thought that they would have to hug one more time. And war just continues to again echo the overall impact on people through these displays. But now we are going to move into Korea and Vietnam and this one is something that a lot of people still present today still feel the effects of because PTSD is still very much so a real thing as a result of this particular set of conflicts. Now as you enter into this section, there is a video that you will want to stop and watch. It puts everything into context as to what brought us to the Korean and also Vietnam War. It's a very well put together video that really traces through history and explains why we entered into this conflict. And I definitely recommend it. As we enter into this section, it's a little bit different. The way that they have it structured is very similar in that they have these glowing areas at the bottom where you can still read, but the photos are more crisp and clear because the photography at the time was a bit better. As you advance through the years, you start noticing that the quality of the photos that they have to work with continues to improve. And because of that, you get a more clear vision of the actual people in the acts that they were having to encounter at that time. And I think that this is where it really clicks in to a lot of us because those people aren't just pixelated photos from the 40s or 30s or even 20s. They're now real people. They have faces, they have features. And the way that they have backlit these, it really is something that has impact all by itself. Then you have the sheer size of the vehicles and it shows you how they might have been used as well, just like the the rest of the museum but I think that this part is a bit different because they actually had people come in from the Disney group to put this section together and so the attention to detail in the sounds and the visuals that you see around is much more concise and because of that you get a very interesting feel when you walk into this section that I can't explain exactly but I want to show you a few of the things that we're seeing and I think you'll understand more. During the Korean War, 
urban warfare became a very different tool and hand grenades were critical in that. They would use these to clear rooms, hallways, buildings. They would use them as a last form of defense in a worst case scenario. And here you have the Mark II Pineapple, the M26, and the M33 grenades. Also, you see that Seoul was a very different encounter because it had four overall battles. Four very distinct parts because the battle itself kept going back and forth. Now along the timeline, you'll see it starts out in 1950 and works its way all the way up till April of 1951. And over this time, they just kept going back and forth through these conflicts. Each of the conflicts is noted by the red marks. So there would be a lull in between and then a regroup and then a re-attack. And so overall, you can see each one of these offensives and then also how they kind of played out along this wall right here. Now, something I really appreciate whenever museums do this is an interactive quality. So this allows you to interact with the content and this goes right along with the video we watched earlier. And it has a touch screen that you can actually follow right up here. So as it is preparing, you're getting to see what exactly that you'll be encountering and doing, and then you will take part in a hands-on kind of way. Now, as you can only imagine, winter time was not fun for the military. And there were a series of different cold climate uniforms that were introduced at that time. It is really harsh in Korea in the winter. And the Korean War, there was no appreciation for just how harsh it would be. So whenever many of the troops arrived they were not equipped for what they would actually need and things had to be altered in order to accommodate for that as you can see here we have several different items that were used as they continued to kind of adapt to those cold temperatures but the troops that had to work in these conditions had very harsh assignments in fact, you can see from the visuals here that they would be marching in the snow, in the blizzard, in the cold. And many times they were not prepared for the amount of days that they would be frigid without any kind of shelter. They would have vehicles that they would traipse alongside and only a fortunate few were able to get inside. And even those vehicles many times did not have heat. So it was an interesting kind of situation to go into this kind of combat under these circumstances. In fact, I think this quote says it all. After Korea, I could never get warm again. Again, guys, this is something that's kind of neat. These are all displays, and again, each one of these is so unique. But this one struck my eye because these are entering Wyoming signs. The actual 300th Armored Field Infantry and Artillery Battalion took these from Wyoming and they set them up whenever they were in Korea. So that's kind of an interesting little fun fact that also relates to the state that we're in. Okay, here's another interactive piece of the museum. On this one, we're going to be able to manipulate this and based on what we do, it's going to show up on the screen. So let's take a look right here. We're starting out June 25th, 1950, and you can see the red line right up there. It says that Korea is actually divided. And as I turn it, the timeline changes and it goes forward. And you can also see how the red changes based on occupation and different things that are happening in the country. And eventually it turns back and forth between that red and blue because we went back and forth multiple times in this conflict until finally you get to today. This guy that we're looking at right now is the M26 and actually replaced the M4 Sherman tank. And at one point in time, the Sherman tank was everything for the military. So by finding this particular tank and turning it into everything that they needed, it was a massive upgrade. And also it was quite large and in charge, as you can see. It could facilitate a lot of different movement and people, but also the guns that it could carry, much more 
impressive when it comes to the overall strength and power, I must say. This thing is really large. Just for a scale, I could lay down three or four times and that would be the length of it. It is pretty long and the tracks on this one come up just beyond my chest. So not quite as tall as the one outside, but taller than some of the others that we've been looking at. Again, looking at the overall impact of the Korean War, it turns out that over $30 billion were paid at the time, which would have equivalated to $276 billion in 2020. From that, 33,739 Americans were lost in action, and an additional 103 1,284 were wounded, not to mention 7,140 were taken as prisoners of war. Now moving from Korea to Vietnam. Vietnam was considered to be the 10,000 day war and it raged on and on and on. This is the one that many people to this day still have a lot of mixed opinions about and many people still are very much so impacted. So as we move through this room, if you were a person who served in the Vietnam War, I would like to say thank you very much for your service right now. And then also if this part is a little bit harder for you to watch, I completely understand. But I do want to share the information for all of those who aren't as familiar with the conflict that happened in Vietnam. Now Vietnam was vastly different than the other wars because for the first time they had access to things like the Huey. The Huey really started to change the way that they would get people in and out and maneuver things within the war zones. The Hueys could drop supplies. They could bring people in and out. If people were injured, they could scoop them up and take them to safety. This really became the war known as the war fought with helicopters. And because of this, the way that this war looked was very different but it also had a much longer toll as a result. So as we move through this, we are going to learn a little bit more about not only the Hueys, but also some of the other impact of Vietnam. And then eventually we will make it into a women in service area, which I think is very important because as a woman myself, I am very proud of all the women out there who do serve because you do a great service for our country. And again, I am so thankful. This quote is the reality, the womp, womp, womp of the rotor's beat was like an angel's voice telling me I'd survive. For many of the soldiers at that time who were stuck in the middle of nowhere under fire, this was their saving grace, the helicopter. And now we move into women in service. Now, from March 1962 to March 1973, when the latest army nurses arrived in Vietnam, 7,484 would serve in the conflict. And this is dedicated to those who served at that time. While we're looking at some of the supplies that the women might have used and also their uniforms that they might have worn, let's talk about a few facts. If a soldier had survived within the first 24 hours of being injured, it was a 99% probability that they would in fact make it thanks to these women primarily. They were medics, they were nurses, they would keep morale up and all of them served as volunteers. It was women like this woman right here on the wall 
who kept the soldiers' spirits up after their injuries, who maintained a rapport with them to keep them thinking positive instead of negative, who brought the sad realities to them in those cases, who assisted them with their wounds, who assisted doctors, and in many cases, who gave unselfishly of their time in order to help others. Here you can see three U.S. Navy nurses being decorated with purple hearts. This is the M-170. It was an ambulance version of the post-Korean War army. This was a round fender jeep. It had an extended wheelbase. It could fit an entire stretcher in there and as you see on both sides you would have the ability to have nurses in there or other military people so they can immediately start working on whoever was in here to get them to a military hospital located somewhere closer to where they were. Here we see some of the stories of the people who actually served, the photos, and also some of their overall outcomes. While many of the women who served in the armed forces did in fact survive, not all did. And all of them had a very large impact on the overall output of what happened. It shows here their names, their photos, their stories, and we honor them. Here we have an M725. This is considered to be a Kaiser ambulance. This one is much larger than the other. These were used in the Vietnam era and this was a 4x4. It was considered to be a heavy ambulance and it was based on the civilian gladiator full-size pickups. Here you notice that there is the ability to have some seating but also two stretchers on the side and this could actually be converted also in case you did need to put someone else there. Down this wall the sad reality of Vietnam year by year you notice that you start having more and more loss of course sadly it doesn't stop there in 1968 they rounded out the rest of those little figures and over 500,000 perished and lost their lives and I think that that is again the sad reality of war those people had full lives ahead. They had ideas of what they wanted to do. Many of them were called out in the draft, so they were young. They were super young. They hadn't even lived life yet. And then they were shipped abroad, told to fight, and didn't return home. Families weren't the same after that. They still aren't. Now I want you all to keep that in mind as we go through this next section. It's one of the largest sections of the entire museum. It is the Vietnam section and it's very impactful guys. It's very much so. I'm going to show you a little bit of it and then we'll talk about it on the flip side. Maybe catch a couple details here and there but I want you to experience this as I am experiencing this. In this section you actually come through the jungle and at each one of the stations you're able to push different buttons and learn a little bit more about what things would have really been like. And I think this is where you really start to see that connection to Disney come through because it's interactive but the way that it's put together is fabulous. You feel like you're kind of really in the jungle and then as it exposes each piece to you, you learn about more what it would have been really been like in those conditions because you're hiding in a bunker or seeing what one of the little bouncing Bettys looks like. And um, it puts it into perspective in a unique way with this canopy of all of this bamboo behind us. So I think that that's just fascinating, but we're gonna keep going. And um, what I see ahead, very intriguing.
So as we walk into the direction center, it's no more than just a shipping container, but it was a makeshift office. And as you could see inside, lots of different things that they would have needed in there. But you can hear overhead them actually giving commands of what they're going to be doing while out in this region. Now this region was said to be inhospitable and it was considered to be the fire base. They said it was called living on the hill and the fire base was hard and boring, but it had comforts not available in the field itself. The field was absolutely brutal and things would happen unexpectedly. However, here there was a little bit more consistency amongst the camp at least. Now as we move from this area, we get to the guard towers. These are super important but also considered to be an extremely vulnerable point because they did rise high atop. So they made them an easy target for enemy combatants. Usually less than 30 minutes after being hit, a seriously wounded man is in the operating room, either at a field hospital or aboard the USS Repose, a hospital ship that has been a welcome addition to our medical facilities in the combat zone. Now we've been to many conflicts before, but until Vietnam, it was never brought front and center to your home, literally to your home. You could read a newspaper or you could hear about it on a radio program, but TV was widely available now. And because of that, there were literal people on the ground filming things and sharing them directly to TV stations. And because of that, it brought the realities of war into the home on a daily basis basis and made it more real and severe. So of course that is why many of the things happened around the time that it did. And this room right here shows us what that might have looked like. Now because the television brought everything front and center, a lot of things started to spring up that weren't typical for other wars. For example, we started noticing the peace movement and also how President Johnson started to slip away and lose the American people. Protests started to ravage the country because people weren't fully committed to the loss of American lives at this time. They thought that it was a poor endeavor for us. They were seeing people that they knew fade into the distance and never return. People that they knew were being taken hostage and held as prisoners of war, and they weren't happy with this. So it's at this time during the Vietnam War that we start to see a lot of things change. We also are entering into the Brown Water Navy, also known as the River Rats. Shortly after the ground troops started to be deployed in South Vietnam, it was discovered that the NVA and VC were making extensive use of the Delta. So in March 1966, the US mobilized a river force. And this room right here, talks a little bit more about that. I have to say, once again, the displays here, the video doesn't do them full justice. You must come and see this. When you're here, you feel like you are a part of the river floating down. You see the shadows on the boat, like it's nighttime and you feel the eerie presence. This is very well done. It's also here that we learn about a Riverton, Wyoming native who served. His name was Wayne Salem, and he was an engineman second class. He was a petty officer. He worked on the patrol boat River 15, section 534, and this is a picture of him right here. Alongside these are a few other photos of Wayne and these are absolutely compelling and striking photos. Again, backlit, so they're very, very visual. You could see the detail, and you can also see what the Delta looked like a bit from these, so you can get an idea of what it would have been like to be there. In addition, you can see some of the docked PBRs right here. Very, very fascinating. But what was a PBR? Well, it was this guy right here, and it was a lightweight constructed fiberglass hull boat, and it drew a mere two feet of water when fully loaded. So it was efficient whenever using it in the deltas and could easily maneuver. In addition, it was equipped with 50 caliber Browning heavy machine guns. So they were able to do a lot in just a small space. In fact, if you look at the corresponding signage again, this is what that would have looked like when it was fully in use and you can see that it could go quite fast and get the job done quite quickly. And as we wrap up this section, once again, we have a few statistics. These 
are pretty terrible statistics. Overall, one. 153,303 Americans overall were wounded and 1,585 were considered to be missing in action. Amongst those, 40,934 Americans were killed in action and 58,220 Americans were dead in the war. But the ongoing toll that potentially wages the most for Americans still today is this stat right here. Right along here you'll see 271,000 veterans are still suffering to this day from post-traumatic stress disorder. Now the war itself cost 168 billion dollars. That's a billion with a B. Billion. Which in 2020 money would have been one trillion dollars or, or more and this was one of the most costly wars that America had been in and also one of the more long-standing wars but again the long-standing portion of this is that it still continues on to this day and still affects many military service members that benefit from the veteran services so if you're watching this video and you know someone who is a veteran who served in Vietnam thank them but also if you have a veteran service group in your area see if you can volunteer do some Something. It, it does help. Trust me, it does. Now in this gallery, there's a variety of different things that we're going to find from the military vehicles themselves to honoring various individuals. And so I'm just going to kind of show you a few of the highlights and then you have to see this and uh, more detail on your own. I think this is one of those challenge moments where I'm challenging you to get up to Wyoming and check it out, but uh, I kind of want to give you a little bit of a taste test because it's awesome. This case, for example, has some very interesting things. Um, I, I directed mostly to this one on the side that looks like a very interesting Basque. This is actually a tank core mass. It's British. And it said the crewman's faces needed protection. So this is what they came up with. This is from the early 1918 kind of time and then also over here you have a pigeon and the u.s army used to use carrier pigeons so this shows what one of the crates would have looked like and then also has a little bit of information down here as to how they would have used those they actually did really use them to take back and forth messages for the military it was kind of interesting this is one of the earliest ambulances that was used by the military. This was a 1917 Model T ambulance. And it said at the beginning of the war in 1914, all European powers actually relied on horse-drawn carriages. So this was a great advantage to have something that was motorized that could move a bit faster and more efficiently. The paint job on this one was very fascinating. So it immediately brought me over. This is actually a trench mortar. It's German. And um, this is kind of fascinating, this paint. I haven't seen this particular pattern pattern before but again we talked about this different places would have different patterns that would echo so that they could be more concealed so I'm very curious as to where this would have been positioned this is a 13th U.S. Cavalry Regimental Standard. This is the flag that was flown at that time it was from 1901 to 1940 A few interesting facts for the road. This talks about all of the people who the U.S. has helped to liberate. Over 475 million people from foreign occupation have in some way, shape, or form been benefited from U.S. involvement in military actions. And then I walked into this section. This is everything. This is a share your thoughts moment. You can come here and actually add to the story of the overall museum, which is already so compelling. And to do so, all you do is sit down and look at these cards. They have a variety of different topics, such as patriotism, freedom, and then also 
reflection here and you can leave your thoughts on what you experienced while visiting the museum today and then you can share those by placing them over on this share your thoughts area and in addition you can read along these sections some of the things that have been said by some of the larger names in the country let's go look at a couple of these when referencing freedom, Willie Nelson said, America, to me, is freedom. When referencing patriotism, John F. Kennedy says, freedom has many difficulties and democracy is not perfect. But we have never had to put a wall up to keep our people in. And when it comes to honor, George S. Patton said, it's foolish and wrong to mourn the men who have died. Rather, we should thank God such men lived. I can't mention to you guys enough how much places like this do have an impact, not only celebrating those who have honored and served, but also helping us to get a better understanding of the world around us. Today we've walked through history and seen not only the American involvement, but also how it still continues to filter through today. We've been able to share our thoughts, and through doing so, we're able to be a part of the story and thus the solution. Okay guys, we have wrapped it up here at the National Museum of Military Vehicles. It has been absolutely an amazing experience. I cannot express to you guys enough how much that you need to try to make your way out here. Again, we're in Wyoming and it's a beautiful drive out, but a more impactful visit within. And so if you happen to be coming through this way on your way to Yellowstone or on your way to Teton or just passing through the state, this is a must stop and I highly encourage you to so just take a moment and uh, go inside. Again, it's $20, it gets you two days worth of admission, and you're gonna need some time to go through it. If you have enjoyed today's video, make sure that you leave a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button, and remember, we're not here for a long time, but we are here for a good time, and some days coming to a place like this is the good time. Till next time, guys, bye!